Tonight, on this Feast of All Souls Day, we'll be talking about the holy souls in purgatory and what we can do to help them. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you pro guests from all over the world. And before we get to our guest that really is related, uh, today's the Feast of All Souls. And it's the day that we spend in prayer for the souls who are in purgatory. Now, I'm not going to tell you too much about it because that is the theme of tonight's show. And I want to introduce our guest who has been writing and teaching for years about the tradition of praying for the holy souls in purgatory. And she's here with us tonight to share her insights. So please welcome the author of the book, Praying with the Saints for the Holy Souls in Purgatory, Susan Tassoni. Susan. Father, great to see you. Now, you're my lawnsman. You're from Chicago, we're right? from the Windy City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a Southwest Sider. Yes, I am. I assume a uh, White Sox fan. White Sox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes Cubs. But let's, hey, let's not talk about religion. <laughs> so so we'll, <laughs> let's get back to the important things about the souls of purgatory. What got you interested in doing the study and writing about the Poor Souls in Purgatory, because you've written, what, about four books now? Um, going on seven. Going on seven. Yeah. So, so what got you interested in this? Well, before I answer that question, Father, you've been so gracious to my, myself and my sister. We have a little something for me from Chicago. Oh, what's and that? And it's to Father Mitch, the smartest and wildest cowboy we know. <laughs> so you get to open it here. Oh, okay, I'll open it now. <laughs> Let me see. All right. This is, well, it's a T-shirt. Yeah. And it says, oh, perfect. Now, life doesn't get any better than that. Happy trails to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We made sure we kept you off the purgatory trail. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll be uh, heading out to Texas next, uh, <laughs> later this month, and uh, I'll make sure I take it with me. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. So, now back to you. Back how it started. How did you get started in this research on the poor souls in purgatory? I'm not sure how I got signed up for purgatory duty, but um, I did have a, an experience on August 11th, 1983. I was hit by a cab, and very much like Father Grishel, um I sustained uh, permanent leg damage. Um, I was crossing the street in the Windy City, very heavy traffic in the loop, and it was coming toward me, and he hit me head on, and I fell on the hood, and he hit me again, and it was the second hit that actually saved me because he threw me 50 feet. So, you know, I was fortunate that I could still walk. I sustained internal leg damage, edema, swelling. I couldn't travel. I have to, you know, if, you're, if I'm going in a, an hour from, you know, from here to Wisconsin or Chicago to Wisconsin, I had to get out, walk around. So, but you learn to live with it, Father. Yeah. I, I was just happy that I could walk and, uh, you know, and I had, I had, a pair of legs. Happy to be alive, And too. happy to be alive. Sure. And so um, I, I had a, I've had a devotion to Our Lady since I was a child. My mother planted the seed in our young hearts. There were seven of us in our family. And uh, I like what Mother Angelica said. There were holy reminders around the house. It was, she had the Pilgrim Virgin. She was head of the Altar and Rosary Society. She, would, she was head of the uh, Legion of Mary and the, uh, I think, Legion of Decency. And I have this vision of her, the Italian lady, running to the drugstores and pulling out all the magazines that shouldn't be in there. Sure. She's very active. Um, so, so they were there. Those, uh, the presence was there. Our faith was, was a live faith. Uh, prayed the rosary. And it, uh, so I've had that devotion. And um, I wanted, I've always wanted to go on a, a pilgrimage, a Marian pilgrimage. And so I, I knew I couldn't fly, so I had to get permission from the doctor. 
and he, he, he thought, okay, you know, he allowed me to go. He says, be sure that you, you walk on the plane back and forth. You'd be sure you do certain things so not to get, to, not to get blood cuts. I wanted to go, though, because I, I just wanted to, you know, experience a Marian pilgrimage. I wanted to be close to Our Lady mm -hmm. and maybe increase my prayer life. Um, and so I did. And lo and behold, to my surprise, I came back and the, the damage on my leg was gone. It was oh, visible great. damage. And I sustained it for 12 years. And I went back to the doctors in Chicago. We have some of the finest doctors in Chicago. And he, he, was, uh, he had watched me for many, many years. He took care of me uh, most of my adult life. And he said, before I, you know, I called him when I got home, he said, did you climb any mountains or anything? And I said, I didn't want to tell a lie. And I said, why don't I just come in and see you? So I went in to see him and he, he looked at me. And he had seen me a week before and you know, the damage you know, was painful. So he said, be careful. Well, it was gone. And he walked out of the room and I didn't know what, where he went. And he came back in and he said, shook his head. He says, dear, it's a miracle. It's, it's gone. It's not there. What was there for 12 years has disappeared. And I've worked in the corporate world, Father Mitch, in Chicago, and the first thing he says, can you put that in writing? And uh, <laughs> he, he looked at me and he said, um, let's wait. He waited three years before he would document it. And um, I said, well, can I travel? And he said, everything is normal, travel. So I just beelined for all the Marian shrines that I've always wanted to go to. Okay. Little did I know, Father, that um, when I was injured by that cab, Little did I know, I learned down the road uh, when I was speaking on purgatory, when I started to talk about purgatory, that I had a, a great aunt. My grandmother had a young aunt, I did, a young sister. We didn't know about it as children, but I found out she was 10 years old. Her name was Little Mary. And um, uh, Little Mary was also injured by a car, 50 years to the day that I was injured. And she died and I survived. And it took my breath away. And I, I, I called up a few uh, priests in Chicago and I said, this is too coincidental. Can you share with me? Is there something I need to know? And they said, yes. They said, sometimes a sacrifice is made for a greater mission. And um, your life was spared. And your mission, at that point, I was already getting involved with purgatory, is purgatory. Um, and so uh, that's your choice. You either follow the mission, uh, you, you know, you have to make a decision. And um, Oh, there was no question, you know, sure. that's, that's what I, I feel in my heart now I was called to do and I need to pursue this and I have ever since. Okay. Now, a lot of people uh, don't know much about purgatory because it hasn't been very high on the radar screen oh, over the last 30, 40 years, even in Catholic catechesis. So a lot of Catholics don't know much about it. What is purgatory about? It's... Um, you know, I'm going to just, actually, I could give you my, the definition of my, my young niece. I'll give you the, her definition and then, you know, the, the, the official definition, okay. if you will. But, but I have, if you don't mind me sharing her definition, she's uh, my goddaughter. And I took pride in teaching her our faith. And I did as much as I can to keep her you know, prayer, the sacraments, um, all the way up until she was um, about 11 years old. And uh, I had already been speaking on purgatory and I was trying to get that message across to her what it was and how it's, uh, it's, it's something that's uh, positive and it's something that uh, is loving. And so um, one day she, uh, she went to my mother and she says, Grandma, and Susie says, there's only three places you can go. My mother's Italian, she says, yes, Angela, what? Yes, that's true. And Angela proceeds to say, heaven, yes, Angela, hell, yes, and puberty. And I said, puberty? I said, I said, mom, I think maybe purgatory is maybe worse than puberty, but maybe she's got a point. I said, it's that training ground into that, for that leap into special joy. Um, so, but the real definition is, it's a, it's a place for purification, Father. It's not a place of punishment. We've heard punishment used, you know, since I was a child. And the more research I did, the more I realized it was, uh, it was the masterpiece of God's mercy. It's a place where he purifies us. And I, and I tried to figure out, well, learn what is this purification? And I read that the purification was, we're being purified by his love. It's his fiery love that removes the rust 
of the sin on our souls. It's his love, it's his justice, it's his mercy um, that purifies us. So we're really being purified by his attributes. So it's a loving purgatory, not a purgatory of punishment. One of the things that uh, you, you say in your book that I like very much is that when we die, we all see God at the judgment and he judges our souls. And the souls who go to purgatory have that sight, but they can't go back to it until they've been purified. And it's that burning desire to see God again yes. that purifies them. Yes, the eyes of, once the soul leaves the body, the eyes of the soul cannot close without being in utter agony because they saw God. They saw him in all his goodness. They saw his glory, his beauty, his majesty. They saw the plan that, had got, that God had for, for you from the beginning of time and, and how you fulfilled that plan. Um, and they felt the intense love that God has for you. And they cry out, God, God, I must be with God because not being able to be with him then, they suffer that loss. So the suffering is the loss of the sight of God. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that needs to be made clear, because a lot of our viewers are not Catholic and they, and some people get confused about what Catholics mean with purgatory. It is not a second chance no. to get to heaven. No. It's only for the redeemed, correct? Yes, it, you're paying off, you're paying, you know, when we die and we stand before God, we're either going to, you know, ascend to heaven or we're going to um, uh, hopefully not go to hell or we're going to sink into purgatory. And when we're in purgatory, um, you can no longer merit. Uh, you know, once the soul leaves the body, the time of merit is over. So you're really, you're paying off a debt. Yeah, and th there's a sense in which, you know, we can have forgiveness of sins. For, I, I think of a lot of examples uh, of people, I hear confessions, my own confessions, where people have various actions they repented of. For instance, you know, I repent of having fought with my younger brother when we were growing up. And I'm sorry I confessed and all that. But sometimes the feelings of anger or resentment might remain. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that needs to be purified. Yes. You can't bring that kind of re desire for getting back at somebody or you know, if you stole something, you can't, you may confess that you stole it, but you can't bring the covetousness. Right. You may confess a sin against lust, but you can't bring the feelings of lust with you and the mm -hmm. memories of it. Mm -hmm. All those need to be purified, and that's what purgatory is for. You named it. It needs to be purified. Uh, in Habakkuk, the, uh, there's a quote that says... The uh, prophet Habakkuk yes, in the Old Testament. Thank you. Yes, Father. Um, his, uh, his eyes are too pure to behold evil. Right. So you need to stand before God in total purity. Right. Uh, he's totally pure. He's totally holy. And that's, you know, why, thank goodness we have purgatory because can we say, at, you know, at the hour of our death that we are totally pure, we've been totally lined up with God's will, and we could enter heaven immediately? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't know. I know it. I can't say this at this point. Right, right. And, you know, the, there's a realization that, you know, we still bring some of the baggage of the effects of past sins, and those have to be cleansed. It's sort of like, I, I oftentimes compare it. I often thought I was clean. My mother would take a look at me and say, the ears, the ears are filthy. You got to get behind the ears. And I couldn't yeah. see that. And that's oftentimes what we have to have cleansed, you know, those things that we don't see about ourselves. Uh, nothing unclean shall enter it, and every, every speck, every stain has to be removed. As you said, the guilt is removed, but the stain is still there. And hopefully we, wo we work off the stain, in, you know, on earth. Right. We're given the grace to do that, you know. The souls in purgatory, Father, don't want us to come to the true purgatory. You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm writing another book, and yes, they, 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 they want, you know, we have the ability to, you know, we've given this great honor and privilege to release them, and they're, 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 they're happy with that, and they want us to do that. But what they truly want, Father, too, is the salvation of their family and their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So they, they're 
praying for us and interceding for us that we make it directly to heaven and avoid the true purgatory. And their prayers and their intercession, um, you know, they pray to the Holy Spirit to inspire us. They want, you know, to make sure that we're on the right path, we don't derail, um, and, and to be sure that we, we don't lose focus of our own sanctification. So that's part of their job as well. Right. Right. So, so they do intercede for us. Yes, they can intercede for us, Father, but they can't pray for themselves. Once the time of merit, or once the soul leaves the body, the time of merit is up. They're, either they're paying off a debt or they're in heaven or hell. Um, and we are their only deliverers. We're their only resource. God has given us this great obligation and privilege um, to, re to release and relieve them. So they look to us, um, the church militant. Uh, you know, as you know, we're part of the, you know, the communion of saints. You know, we're the church militant fighting the good fight. Here on earth. Here on earth. Here on earth. That's why we call it the church militant, because we're fighting against the, the kingdom of darkness. Exactly. A plus, Father. And um, there's the church suffering, the, the souls in purgatory. Um, and then there is the church triumphant. And what I realized while I was reading and praying and pouring over this is that we're not alone and nothing is done alone. It's the, um, it's the church militant that reaches out to the church suffering and enjoins them to the church triumphant. Nothing is done alone. Right. This, that's a very important part of, you know, the things that you say about this is that we're, we're all in this together as, and look, we're both from Chicago. We understand that just because you're dead, it doesn't mean you can't vote, <laughs> right? Father, you know, we, do, we, we don't lose our, our civil rights just because we're dead. And the same thing in the Catholic Church, you know, that you can pray for the yeah. dead and, and so that they get to heaven. Part of our goal tonight, Father, is to get some of those uh, politician souls out of purgatory in Chicago. That's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> now, that's one of the things that we, um, uh, uh, there's so much in your book to, to talk about. I want to make sure that we cover this area. What can the souls here on earth, the, the church militant, yes. what can we do to help the poor souls in purgatory? Number one, first and foremost, is to have masses offered for them. Um, the mass is the highest um, form, highest act of worship. It's the highest form of prayer. They need the body and blood of Jesus. They need they need the mass. So, have uh, who do you miss the most? You know, who do you wish you could have done more for? Who hurt you spiritually? Who were your enemies? Who helped you? Have a mass offered for them because the mass heals the living and the deceased. Right. Um, and, and of course, if we, my favorite, and I'm... And, and, and a good point there, I, I loved, I heard years ago, it's very difficult to stay angry with somebody you're praying for. Yes, in fact, uh, I speak, uh, Saint, uh, Pope Benedict talks about that. It, you know, uh, the Eucharist also heals you and helps you to forgive um, and to accept forgiveness as well. Um, then there's our, our good friend, Pope Saint Gregory. If I could, if I could share with sure. you, um, he's just, he's just, He's, he's on the cover of my book. This is book. Pope St. Gregory the First. The, yes. He, he Gregory was the Great. Gregory the Great. Pope St. Gregory the Great. Father, he, was, uh, he brought us the Gregorian chant. He, he, actually, he brought us even the term, God bless you. Um, that was uh, something I just learned recently. Um, he, uh, he was the first monk to be Pope. He was, uh, he was just, uh, I understand he was a mayor and a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, for me, he, he was the one to bring us the chief devotion of the souls in purgatory, uh, which is the mass. And there's just a fascinating story, if you, if you would allow me. We have me, a few minutes. Yeah, if you allow me to share it with you. Um, put these in your will, these Gregorian masses. He brought us Gregorian masses. Um, uh, he, he was ill. At, he was sickly, a sickly man. And he had a... a one of the monks named Justice. Justice was a physician and Justice took care of, of uh, St. Gregory. Well, Justice got sick and it was his last illness. He was dying. And St. Gregory had his brother Copiosis come and, uh, and take care of uh, Justice because Copiosis was a physician too. So he did, and, but unfortunately, Copiosis found some coins in Justice's cell. And as you know, um, they, they Monks took aren't supposed to have no it. money, um, and uh, they took the vow of poverty. Well, he, he, he shared that with, uh, with uh, the monks and, and St. Gregory, and it grieved Gregory uh, because he, took, he takes those vows seriously, and so should his, his, his monks. And so he told the monks not to visit with him. 
um, and, and let Copiosis take care of them. And Justice realized it, that they weren't there. And he asked Copiosis what happened. And he said, well, you know, he, he shared that, you know, they're, they're not allowed to visit you. He grieved, he, he repented, and then he died. Well, Justice um, Gregory knew he was in purgatory, uh, probably from a revelation. He ordered 30 masses to be offered. Why 30 masses, Father? Why not 50 or 60? Uh, you shared this with me in part of my research. 30 masses goes back to the Old Testament, where um, for 30 days Moses and Aaron and Jacob um, were mourned for. And so he was bringing back the tradition of, of mourning for justice and offering masses for 30 days. On the 30th day, Justice appeared to his brother Copiosis and um, said he was out of purgatory. Copiosis ran to the monastery and shared this with the monks, and the monks realized it was on the 30th day that uh, uh, he was released, 30th Mass. Um, so uh, that's where we get the, you know, the tradition of having 30 Masses offered. As a matter of fact, uh, there's the Church of St. Gregory in Rome. Yes, yes, yes. And at that Church of St. Gregory, there is an altar that sort of tells the story. Yes, Father. Uh, as a yes. matter of fact, on the left panel of the Lord, it says, St. Gregory has freed the soul of this monk by 30 Masses. At this altar, where the first Gregorian Masses were offered, at this altar. At that very altar. And the then very at altar. the center altar panel, it says that the suffering Jesus Christ is seen here by Pope Gregory celebrating Mass. So that, because that's one of the things about the Mass. The Mass is primarily the action of Jesus Christ. That's why the, he, the priest acts in the person of Jesus, but it's Jesus who's really doing the action. And then there's also a right panel, and it says, in this room, Pope Gregory celebrated Masses to release souls from purgatory. So this is, uh, you know, the, the, the three panels there, and that altar is still there, correct? It's still there to this day. In fact, when, uh, when w after the Masses were, were offered for justice and the, the monks, monks were excited and his brother were excited, it spread all over uh, the city. And people were coming to that altar asking to have masses offered. And, and then it went across the ocean. Priests from Spain and France were coming in uh, to offer masses at that altar uh, to release their loved ones as well. Okay. So, so this idea of celebrating the mass to release souls in purgatory goes back at least to St. Gregory the Great. Though the, the idea of praying for the dead is also in all the liturgies. You know, it doesn't matter if it's the Western liturgy or the Eastern liturgies. The Eastern Rite Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox always pray for the dead. In fact, you said the Eastern Rite. Uh, uh, the Eastern Church does not celebrate All Souls Day, Father. Today, yeah, today yes. we don't celebrate it. We, right. We, the Maronite, in the Maronite Rite, we don't celebrate today. We celebrate it right before Lent. Right. During Lent, um, they call it All Souls Saturdays. Every Saturday is given over to the souls in purgatory, mm -hmm. um, and what they, you know, they they want the souls to be included in in the sacrifices and penances that we do during Lent, so they could share too in in the resurrection at Easter. Right. It's a great way uh, for us during Lent, if we're looking for a special devotion. You know, we have the Way of the Cross for the Holy Souls in Purgatory to offer your Saturdays uh, for the souls in purgatory. See, another thing too. I mean, I grew up hearing this all the time. You know, when something bad happens or there wasn't enough candy or, you know, you got hurt or you, did, you got a little sick or whatever it might be, they always said, offer it up for the poor souls. Offer it up for the poor souls. What, what does that mean to offer up your suffering for it's, the it's, poor souls? It's just, um, they get the grace, Father, of, of, of your pain. You're, you're, you're uniting your, your, your pain, your suffering uh, with our Lord, and that, that actually helps them and shortens their purgatory, Father. Your sufferings, and this is really uh, something that kind of excited me, is to offer up doing good. There's the, there's the sacrifice of doing good, Father. I, I'm, as again, I'm working on another book, and it just struck me that we need to also, uh, there was a soul that had visited someone, and they said, do good, be good, and think good, and be good to the animals. They needed the sacrifice of doing good because they didn't love during life. 
So when I feed my little cats that I Veronica, found roaming around yes, my yard, <laughs> uh, so a couple of strays, and I, then a couple more strays showed up. When I feed them, I'm helping the poor souls. You're doing good. <laughs> doing good for the animals and helping the poor souls. Yeah. Yeah, so the sacrifice is doing Lord knows good. those cats don't do me any good. <laughs> 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 Except they're cute. Um, one of the other things, too, that you've written, uh, you've got some books here, uh, we'll pass that one over on the, the way of the cross. You've got one book called The Rosie for the yes. Holy Souls in Purgatory. You've also got one, The Way of the Cross yes. for the Souls in Purgatory, yes. and 30 Day Devotions for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. So you've got a number of these books that are ways to teach people how to pray for the yes. poor souls besides the offering of Mass. Yes, Father. Uh, I call them the four pillars. After the Mass, alongside the Mass, the Rosary is the most powerful Marian prayer on earth to help the souls in purgatory because of the indulgences attached to them. The Way of the Cross, same thing. There's an indulgence attached to the Way of the Cross. Um, there's a, a great, uh, especially during the month of November and during Lent, there's a great, great um, touching uh, story I learned um, uh, there was a, 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 a nun, and they had a visiting bishop, and she was, uh, it was the end, of the, the end of the day, and she was shutting the lights off and heading toward the chapel, and she heard the rustling down the aisle, and she looked in, she, she realized it was the visiting bishop. He was on his knees, crawling from station to station, and it just took her by surprise and touched her. She pulled back, and the next day, she shared this with her sisters, not knowing that this was going to be John Paul II. This was a John Paul, blessed John Paul, a man of simple piety. He knew hardship. He knew the hardships of his people, and he united all that in that simple devotion of praying the way of the cross. In fact, that was the book father that had the great honor and privilege of handing him the book. And he took my breath away because he took it away from me and he, and he, in a deep voice, very good, very good. And um, he blessed the book and uh, Bishop Jeevish at the time says, what do you got there? And so uh, I gave him a copy and uh, there was over 75,000 copies of that book have been sold. It's a powerful devotion. And um, it was hard for me to do the stations, but the reason I like this because it has to do with the souls, it has to do with my family, it has to do with, you know, with it's a personal journey, um, and that's what uh, really touched me about doing the particular devotion. One last thing, because we have to take a break pretty soon, but uh, one of the things about offering the Mass is I want to make sure we get this out. A lot of times, parishes can't do the Gregorian 30 days Masses because they have so many requests that they can't do it. You came up with a solution by going to the missionaries and, and, and use, asking missionaries to do this. Tell us quickly about that. The, the missionaries, I learned about uh, the, the plight of, uh, of our Catholic missionaries. They have no uh, mass stipends, Father. Um, and uh, I, so I, I just decided to take up a collection to help uh, you know, the souls in purgatory through the mass for, and have the missionaries uh, missionaries uh, offer these masses. So um, what's really important is that this stipend we're giving them, and I'll never forget what the, the, the nun told me when I had, you know, had some stipends for her. We actually, we were able to get $2 million worth of stipends, but I looked, I like it as 2 million souls out of purgatory, that she said, you know, when you give a stipend to a missionary priest, she said, it puts gas in the Jeep to get up to the mountains to offer mass for people that sometimes only hear mass once a year. And she right. says, you know what else it gets? She says, you're buying books for a seminarian. And she said, you know what you get when you buy books for seminarians? And I said, what? She says, a priest for 40 years. Right. And that, that did it. So I, I really, you know, like to help missionary priests. In fact, uh, the and Pious Union is, uh, is, is one of the areas. Sister Margaret, Margaret Schlesser was on your, on your show. Right. And they, um, they have uh, Gregorian masses for their missionaries in Vietnam and in, in, um, in India. So and there was a great shortage of... Uh, and, and, they, and they would love to have those yes. stipends. And that's a great way to get Gregorian masses, 30 masses uh, over 30 day period offered for your, the, the, the deceased of your families. And it does a double good, not only helping the poor souls, but helping the missionaries. The missionaries. We have to take a break. Uh, we're going to come back in just a couple minutes. We want to get some of your questions and your comments, so please stay with us.
Welcome back. Welcome back. I uh, want to welcome our audience. We have a nice group of pilgrims who have come all the way from Canada. And it's great to have them, plus a few folks scattered from other parts of the United States. Uh, so we, we welcome all of them. And we'd love to have you come and join our studio audience. If you can come down and make a pilgrimage here at EWTN, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205 271 2966. 205 271 2966. And they'll help, or you can go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll help you with all sorts of information about where you can stay, the scheduling for the masses, programs, tours of the studio, how to get up to Hansville to see the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament, all that. And we'll uh, look forward to seeing you here in our studio. It makes it a lot more fun for us. All right, you ready for some I'm questions? Ready. We have a caller on the line, Julie. Hello, Julie. Hi, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm from State College, Pennsylvania. Great, My and what's your question? Father, uh, you mentioned uh, your mother saw your dirty ears. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I worry about my dirty ears. How can we confess when we can't see our sins? Oh, great question. Do you want to... How can we confess? How can we confess something that we don't, when we don't see our sins? I'm not sure how that... But well, see, here's, here's one of the things. You know, we usually say in confession that for these and all the sins of my oh. past life, I'm heartily sorry. And so you include all that. If you forget a sin that you've committed but are sorry for, for offending God in general. Our Lord forgives you for it. But the effects of it still have to be gotten at. And that's what we're talking about. Does that help you, Julie? Yes, it does, Father. And I want to thank Susan for her work. Uh, she's taught me so much. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Julie. Appreciate you calling it's in. It's a team effort, Father. Yep. Yes, it is. We have a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from um, Canada, Ancaster, Ontario. And what's your question? My question, Susan, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to ask you this question. Why are they called poor souls? It's, that's, a, that's a great question. It's the most common asked question. Actually, I get why are they called poor and holy because sometimes we hear poor, poor souls, we hear holy souls. They're called poor because they lost their poverty, Father, is the loss of the sight of God. They're called poor because they can no longer merit. They rely, they rely totally on us. They're called poor because they don't know when they're going to be released from purgatory. They're called holy because they can no longer sin. They uh, are in the state of grace uh, and they know they're saved and they know at some point they're going to, you know, uh, join, join the beatific, join God in heaven. Yeah, so th that, that's a great answer. That's a great way to put it. Uh, thank you very much. And we have another caller on. Is it Gina? Yes, Father. Hi, Gina. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Vero Beach, Florida. And what's your question? Yes, my question is, um, and, um, I lost my 24-year-old son two and a half years ago oh, I'm so from sorry. an accidental overdose from the pain uh, mills in South Florida. Mm -hmm. But my question is this. Um, I learned so much about suffering, and through the grief and the devastating sorrow that I have carried, um, I have continued to offer my suffering up for my son's soul. Yeah. But I also I had like um, three Gregorian masses said for him. And totaling, I think I've had like 300 masses said for him. And I just don't know when I can relax. Great. You know, first of all, you know, I'm very sorry for your loss. I and mean, that's, it's the worst thing that can happen to any parent. And I'm very sorry for your loss. And your question, you know, um, is very important. I, one of the things that I want to say before I let Susan you. respond is it's very important for you to let go of the anxiety and put your trust in Jesus. Jesus is going to be the one who has you and your son in his care. And that's going to be very key so that you don't feel anxious. That's not what, what our Lord wants you to do. It's not what the church wants you to do. 
But go ahead and, and you take the rest I, of the question. I, I guess I can identify. We, we just lost uh, we, another brother and it was a, and it was a sudden death. And um, it broke my heart, you know, because, um, you know, he, he hadn't uh, gone to confession. And so um, I, I, it's prayer that heals the heart, you know. It's the prayer that took away the anxiety. It's the Gregorian masses. It's remembering him at mass and also, um, you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself. I feel his presence, Father. You know, only in our family do we know those little things that we all identify with. We identify cardinals in our family. When we see a cardinal, you know, big brother's up there. You know, we, right. we feel his intercession. So I think just uh, I agree with you. It, it, just you can let go of the anxiety. He's in, but he's in God's hands. One other thing, too, that uh, I'd like your re response to is she's offered three sets of Gregorian masses and all over 300 masses for the repose of her son uh, to, to, to be freed from purgatory. Is, if he's already in purgatory, mm -hmm. if he's already in heaven and he's out of purgatory, is she wasting the masses? Oh, great question, Father. Nothing's ever wasted and you can never outdo God in generosity. Usually you hear the common uh, answer is that God will take the graces or maybe apply it to somebody in the family or pri apply it to other souls in purgatory, but he's, it's, he's bigger than that. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas calls it accidental glory. And what is accidental glory? If a soul is already in heaven and you continue to pray for them, they get two things. They get an increase in their intimacy with God and they get an increase in their intercessory power. So the lesson is, is never stop praying for your dead. As mother says, you keep pushing them up. You give them a boost. Yeah, it's just Mother Gina Angelica. that while it's good to keep praying for your son, let go of that anxiety. You know, put your trust in him. And one of the things, too, I'm going to ask you to do, really develop your devotion to the Blessed Mother. She knows exactly what it's like to lose a son. Mm -hmm. And be with Mary as she's holding the body, the pieta, where she's holding the body of her dead son. Be with her in your prayer so that she can console you in the, this anxiety and give you the peace that she had even after Jesus was crucified and she had to lay his body in the tomb. And trust that our Lord's going to be taking good care of you and your son. Okay? Let's go to another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Great, good to have you. And what's Thank your you. question? Right. My question, um, all the, the souls in purgatory, I've been told that there are seven different levels as you're being purified. I was wondering if um, you or Susan could expand on that. I know that's Dante, Father. That might be your, your specialty. Yeah, Dante describes that in his Divine Comedy. He based the Divine Comedy on the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas. And he understood that just that there are seven levels of hell as well uh, and heaven, you know, so that seven being the number of perfection. And the process of going through the purification is what he's trying to describe. But he's using his imagination based on the teaching of St. Thomas uh, Aquinas, because as I said to one of my callers on my radio show today, I've never been to purgatory, neither had Dante. The return visa is very difficult to get. <laughs> so uh, the entrance card is not so easy either. So, uh, so uh, 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 we'll, we'll leave that up to him. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. We'll have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? From Port Colborne, Ontario, in Canada. Great, great. Another part of our Canadian visitors. It's so good to have you here. I was wondering whether you had to wait for to get your glorified body before you had the beatific vision. In other words, I think it unites at the, at the final In other judgment. words, that you don't get to see God, even if you're among the redeemed. You're not in purgatory or hell, but you're among the redeemed, all right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and her question is, do you have to wait? When your soul is separated from your body, you can't see God. You only have to wait to the resurrection of the uh, dead at the end of time. No, well, 
obviously when the soul uh, leaves the body, they're before the beatific vision because what right. they're suffering is the loss of the sight of God. So I, yes, they have, they have seen God. And if they go to heaven, can they see God? Of course, well, yes. And do they have to wait till the resurrection of the I dead? I don't think so. No, no, that's <laughs> right. No, that's exactly right. You know that, um, you know, when the soul dies, if it's one of the redeemed who go to heaven, they'll see God. Yeah. Those souls will see God. And that will be the beatific vision? Yeah, you'll see the beatific yeah. vision. Okay. You'll also see it in the body at the resurrection of the there dead. There you go. Okay. All right, but you'll see him, see him in heaven. So you don't have to wait. There, there's, there are certain re- denominations that teach that you go into soul sleep until the end of the world hmm. and that your soul is asleep and you don't see God. Now, the problem with that is it contradicts what we see in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it's very clear that the souls are seeing God. Mm -hmm. They're talking to God. Mm -hmm. They're interceding Mm -hmm. for us with God Mm -hmm. in a variety of ways. So so that doctrine of soul sleep Mm -hmm. until the end of the world Mm -hmm. is not scriptural. Mm -hmm. You know, and St. Okay. Paul also in uh, Philippians chapter one says, I would rather be with Christ and out of the body, mm-hmm. you know, so that if he died, he would be with Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he says, it's better for me to be in the body for your sake. But for my own sake, I'd rather be out of the body and with Christ. Mm-hmm. So St. Paul also clearly teaches that there's no such thing as soul sleep. This is a false doctrine and we don't need to believe that at all. We have another caller. Hello, Joe. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you're a fully <laughs> confessed Catholic um, and you say at the end of the confession, I'm sorry for all my past sins, and there are sins that you forget that you remember a few weeks later, um, do you go to heaven right away or do you have to go to purge the sins uh, that, you've con- that you've forgotten to confess in purgatory? Thank you. I'll listen for your answer. In other words, say, it goes back to the other question. You go to confession. Mm-hmm. You forget a certain sin. So you don't mention it, but say, I'm sorry for these and all the sins of my past life. It's included. So mm-hmm. the question is, would you have to go to purgatory for the sin you forgot or not? That's the question. I, my understanding is that that's all, that's all part of the, the confession, even exactly. if you forgot them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. As a matter of fact, uh, if you forget a sin then, and later on remember it, then take it to your next confession. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you don't have to go to confession an extra time you know, for that. You know, just go to your next regular confession, mm-hmm. and, which I hope is not only at Christmas and Easter, but, he, <laughs> but that's another issue. But um, take it to your next regular confession and... Uh, ask the priest for forgiveness. But if you forget, it's forgiven. And you don't necessarily have to go to extra purgatory because you forgot. Purgatory, you know, the, the suffering in purgatory is not about a forget rap. That's right. You know, the, the suffering is worse than any suffering or illness on earth, Father, because right. of the, the, what they saw. Right, the longing for God. The longing for God. In fact, it was um, Faustina, Father, that had experienced uh, a vision of purgatory, and um, she she asked the souls, um, you know, what's their greatest pain? And in one voice, they said, "Longing for God." Also, she was uh, our Lord allowed her to experience uh, she longing for Holy Communion. She longed for Holy Communion so intensely that she thought she was going to die. And he said to her that he wanted her to experience what the souls were experiencing, that great longing for God. Okay. And this is 24 hours a day, Father, seven days a week without any repose. We tend to think about the souls in purgatory, the November 2nd or the month of the souls. And then, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. Right. But we have to remember them all year, all year long. Right. You know, we have to take them home for Christmas. Uh, my understanding is that most souls are released on Christmas Day, not all Souls Day. And then the next group of souls are released at Easter so we can, you know, 
uh, pray, bring them into our, our Easter, uh, our Lenten, um, our Lenten duty. And then after Lent, we've got um, the great Our Lady's feast days, Our Lord's feast days. In those days, many souls are released at, at, on purgatory. So it's it's not something we we need to do all year long. Yeah, and I I always uh, offer mass for my dead parents on their wedding anniversary, mm -hmm. birthdays, on my birthday mm -hmm. because without them I wouldn't have a birthday. You know, and I remember on their birthdays, you know, the Christmas, you know, these these kind of things. All these should be times for us to remember mm -hmm. our, our, our family members. And, and also speaking of masses, Father, it's also important to have masses offered while you're alive. Yeah. Um, a, a, a professor in Rome uh, uh, answered my question, you know, about is that true? Are they more powerful? But he, he says it's, it's, it was much deeper than that. And he explained what, what it can, the graces you received uh, throughout your life when you have them offered, you know, while you're alive. So during the holidays, um, you know, give the gift of prayer. It's infinite. It's, it, it does, there's no end yeah. to it. Yeah. That's one of the, my favorite uh, ordination gifts 35 years ago was a permanent enrollment in a Carmelite monastery mm -hmm. for the nuns to be praying for me. I depend wow, on that all these wow. years. We have another question. Ma'am, where are you from? From Hamilton, Ontario. Hamilton, Canada. Ontario. And your question is? Uh, do we, can we use the Gregorian Masses for more than one person, for a group of people? Can you use the, have the Gregorian Masses said for more, more than, than one person? Yeah, canon law says uh, it's only for one to see soul, not a couple, not a family, one to see soul. So, so it's Gregorian Masses per uh, deceased soul. Mm -hmm. So that would be one person at a time. All right, we have a call, Ben from Australia. Ben, you win the Long des Distance Award. Uh, yes, Father. Can you hear me? Just perfectly. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, I'm ringing from Australia. How's it going there? Ready for talking to you. Uh, good. Um, I've got two questions, Father. Uh, one for you and one for, for, one for Susan. I've got a great interest in purgatory because I run an organization from here called the Friends of the Suffering Souls. Okay. And we run a perpetual novena of matters for the Holy Souls with members all around the world, okay. quite a, uh, some thousands of members in the United States. And uh, each of those members arranges at least one mass each year for the Holy Souls, because we believe the tremendous importance of the mass to, um, for the benefit of the Holy Souls. Right. right. We've got members in over 80 countries, and this year we've already arranged over 25,000 masses. Beautiful. Wow. And my question for Susan was, is with regard to that, because our association is based on NOC, uh, which is to do with masses, was to do with masses for the Holy Souls and Our Lady of Parents at NOC. And I'd like to ask Susan if she would tell the folks out there about NOC uh, in these terms of how it shows how much our Blessed Mother wants us to pray for the Holy Souls. All right. So okay, yes, uh, I speak about Our Lady of Knock in, in my latest praying with the saints, and um, Archde Archdeacon Kavanaugh had um, offered a hundred masses for the souls in purgatory, and that was the time I understand Father during the Great um, Potato Famine, and um, he he offered a hundred masses, and it was um, on the hundredth mass that Our Lady appeared um, in, in Knock, and it was a very um, different apparition. She appeared in silence, and they call her Our Lady of Silence. Um, and the altar, uh, uh, the there was the altar with the with the sacr you know, the, the altar with the lamb, which to me symbolizes the um, which symbolizes the mass, which actually helps you know this, what, what is leads to the the point of praying for the souls in purgatory. Um, also, she she had a. Um, crown on her head, which symbolized her queenship and being queen of, e of, of, um, of Ireland and um, a rose on her forehead. And that rose symbolized um, the rosary. Uh, so you've got the mass, the rosary, which are very powerful ways to help the souls in purgatory. And it, it, it's been said that the, um, the, the, the souls had something to do. Their intercession had, her, you know, their intercession brought her to, uh, uh, to knock to console the people during that, uh, that terrible time. It's also been pointed out that this is the only apparition that has the, the altar, um, which symbolizes the mass, and that it's the main feature of this shrine. And that um, I think 
uh, 10,000 masses were offered in honor of Our Lady of Knox, so they did not have to enter the war, which they didn't. And also the majority of miracles um, that people experienced there took place during the mass. Okay. So uh, it's a it's a powerful. Uh, uh, oh, the signal. She in silence. They were the, the interpre interpretation of her being in silent silence was the urgency of prayer, and um, so it was the urgency of prayer, and then pointing to the sacrifice of the mass and the sacredness of that. Okay, we have another call. At Father Jim. Hello, Father Jim. Hello, Father Mish Parker. How are you? Parker here. Where are you from? I wanted to say, hello. Where are you from? I'm from East Dubuque, Illinois, the Rockford Diocese. Great. And what's your yeah, question? Susan, my question, uh, Susan, I want to thank you for coming for the parish last year. But in your travels, why don't more priests talk about this uh, doctrine of purgatory? As a matter of fact, we have a person who has a question along the same line. Ma'am, what's your question? Well, my question is, um, <clears throat> I've been to quite a number of funer Catholic funerals, and other than the formal prayers that they say for the dead, the priests do never, never mention purgatory, and I'm just wondering if it's because uh, of the feelings same of as the Father Jim's deceased question. person. Yeah. That's a good question, and I, I'm not, I don't know, Father. I'm not sure what the discomfort is, because it's a very positive part of our faith, right. positive part of our doctrine, um, and it's a consoling doctrine, and when... I'm speaking about it, you know, people's hearts are on fire for, for, for the, to help the souls in purgatory, so I, right. it's a mystery to me. I think, uh, Father Jim and ma'am, um, one of the things that I hear a lot is, is that a lot of sermons at funerals are practically canonization processes, yes, right, right. you know, where you, you say how great the person is and how they're already in heaven. And that's meant to console the family, but, you know, that's not something, you know, we can't canonize the dead. You know, uh, that's not our job. That's the job of the official church, not of the local pastor. And rather than focus on whether that person is in heaven or hell, uh, we need to focus on what we can do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the call to virtue, the call to conversion, and the call to pray for the poor souls. I think that funerals and other times of teaching are very important for us priests. Now, I'd also have to say this. Depending on when the priest went to seminary, he may not have been taught very much mm -hmm. about purgatory. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 70s and 80s, it was not a strong theme mm -hmm. in the classroom. And so a lot of people did not hear, a lot of priests did not hear, can, you know, purgatory taught. I've even heard of some priests and nuns saying, oh, Vatican II got rid of purgatory. Have you heard that? A lost continent, yeah. Right, 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 right. right. That's yes, not I've true. Lumen Gentium, paragraph 11, mentions the, soul, the suffering souls. And so, you know, it's in Vatican II. And we, this is one of the things about doing this program, you know, with you, Susan, and the work that you're doing and encouraging people to get these books uh, and say, the, you know, your prayer books as well as your study book, uh, to have a sense of restoring mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. doctrine. Uh, because it's a doctrine, it's a dogma of the faith. It was defined at the Council of Trent and earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, Council right. of Florence, Florence, yeah. Florence in 1437. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these councils have defined this dogma. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, you know, even in controversy. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we have this teaching mm -hmm. clearly taught. And, you know, it would be good to encourage priests to do that. We have this in the book, the, the latest book I did, Father, I gathered all the writings of Pope um, Benedict on the last five years, or the first five years of his pontificate on what he said about purgatory and put it into a nine-day novena. So his writings are there. The new book that will be out next year, I'm doing the same with John Paul II 
Um, yeah. So it's Good. there. The yeah, doctrine the is there. The teaching is there, yeah. and we have to recover. And, and Father, the, the books are, they're devotionals. These are, these are, I said the pillars. These are the, I try to work on the best ways to help them out, which is the Eucharist, the Mass, the Rosary, and the Stations. That's why we did, we did the books. All right. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, so thank you very oh, much for being you, here, for writing these books, and for doing the work that you do. And I'm going to bless everybody with a relic of St. Gertrude and St. Nicholas of Tolentino, who is the patron saint of the souls of purgatory, and St. Gertrude who offered great prayers for them. May the Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and by the intercession of Saints Gertrude and Nicholas of Tolentino, keep you firm in your prayers for the souls of purgatory. And again, please remember that we need your support for this network. Keep us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Amen and God bless.